Corporate financial reports are filled with technical terms, and they have to follow a very specific format. Well, Matt Smith from Good Soil Investment Management spoke with us to demystify some of the technical aspects and to help us understand what it all means. This is part three in the series, and a link to the earlier ones will be in the description below. And of course, there are timestamps to the specific questions so you can skip around. I'm Brian. Welcome to my Tesla weekend. So, so it's not risky. What counts, as, uh, what counts as operating expenses and what counts like against it? So operating expenses is, is maybe it's best to think of it as, as like one overall bucket of, of expenses. So the two biggest bucket of expenses that there's a couple others, but there's um, what, what's kind of called cost of goods sold. And that's like all the, um, the steel that goes into the car, the factory workers, the depreciation of the plant, that sort of thing. But then okay. there's um, the other bucket of expenses is, is kind of think of it as like the head office folks. Um, so you've got okay. like all your accounting, you've got your um, research and development team, Okay. Um, you've got um, that R and D is one of the one of the big expenses that, that falls under there. You're selling general and administrative, so a lot of companies would have like marketing expenses that fall under there. Obviously, that's not the case for Tesla, um, but one of the the bigger buckets that does fall under operating expenses right now is the stock based compensation. Um, so okay. we're we're through that with uh, or through the, the vast majority of that with with Elon's CEO compensation plan, um, but there still is um, stock based compensation for all the other employees as well that kind of flows through there right now. So okay. I, I kind of tend to think of it as like the white collar employees plus all the stuff that you need at your corporate headquarters to operate a business. So uh, rent? Yep, rent. Um, utilities? Utilities, yep. I'm probably Maintenance not utilities. on properties? What's that? Maintenance on properties? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, that, that could depend. Like, Like if you're maintaining a machine say on the on your like manufacturing plant that probably would would make its way into pp and e and, and so it would be depreciation expense that would hit your uh, cost of goods sold um mm -hmm. but you know if you are like you need to <clears throat> repave your your headquarters parking lot in austin or something like that then yeah sure like that's probably sure. an expense that, that rolls through there um yeah like lawn service or something like that sure that that'll that'll flow through operating expenses okay I mean, it's, and so it's, all the stock stuff is in OPEX. Yep. All the okay. stock based compensation. Yep. And revenue from premium connectivity, performance boost. Where do those That's, go? So that actually goes into automotive sales. Um, okay. So it's, it's a, the service line. No, it's um, in the automotive sales line. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's maybe a little bit confusing, but, but those are actually related to the, the car itself. So there's, they, they do give a breakout in, in the, um, like in the 10 K. And, and so, um, premium connectivity, let me find the actual language here. Um, so if I sold one car that quarter and made zero profit, and then somebody who already owned a car paid 2000 for performance boost, it would appear as though I made 2000 in sales. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, 2000 in gross margin. So, because uh, right, if you sold profit. one car, yeah, yeah. Right. Where does the offshore revenue and taxes show up? Um, so, so that gets consolidated in the all the other other lines. So, you know, you sell cars in Germany, you sell cars in China. They all kind of go into it's that automotive sales. All in the same. Yep. Okay. So they, they need to, together. you know, if they're denominated in yuan or, or in, you know, euros, they, they have to make a conversion to that um, right. back to dollars. So, you know, there, there's that to, to take into account. But um, they don't um, have separate financials um, for, uh, you know, the, the geographies that they're, they're selling into. Um, okay. Taxes, those do get accounted for um, in... The bottom line, so there's you know earnings before tax, and then there's a provision for income taxes. Uh, okay. It's labeled there, um, so that is essentially a blend of the rate because they're they're paying okay. you know income taxes. They, I, I'm not sure if the company itself was subject to income taxes in California. I think it was not, uh, but I could be wrong on that. Um, certainly, property taxes they were, but there's there's income taxes. The federal income tax is kind of a big one. So there's U.S. federal income tax, which is 
offset by their historical net uh, net operating right. losses. That's something we could dive into if you if you wanted to. But um, and then there's you know tax rates on their operations in you know China and in Europe and elsewhere. Sure. So that blended rate that they have, it's close to. 15%. It fluctuates a little bit, but it's been between like 10 and 20% typically historically sure. is kind of a blended rate of all the different jurisdictions which have income tax. You would you would be surprised how high the tax rate is on businesses in Shanghai. It's, in, it's I, quite... You cut out for a second there. You said in Shanghai? Oh, in Shanghai, the tax rate is massive. It is, to me... A lot higher than I expected. They expect they uh, the deal to get the land was something like they have to pay a hundred million in taxes over ten years, something like yeah. that. Yeah, so that may not show up in in um, income taxes then, because there is a difference. So there's some jurisdictions will tax you based on how much profit you have generated from your your local entity. Right, but this um, is more like a um, I believe it's what's property this? taxes, B and O tax kind of thing. Oh yeah, well, I yeah. Yeah, so so Great. that 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 sort of tax is, is likely to show up either in uh, cost of goods sold or in um, operating expenses. Um, okay, because it's it's kind of just like like a flat line. It's not dependent on how profitable right. you are, how many vehicles you sold right. necessarily. Um, so that's um, it's definitely important to <laughs> to, to you know, keep track of it, but um, it, it it does show up there in in a separate line. Gotcha. So. What is the difference between diluted and non-diluted GAP and non-GAP? Diluted. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's a very important distinction. So um, the company has something like 900, just, just shy of uh, 1 billion shares outstanding right now right. Of, of common stock. Um, and so that's, you know, if you own some shares, I own some shares, Elon owns some shares, you total all those up. And that's, you know, just under a billion shares. However, there's also like stock-based compensation or um, the CEO performance award. And that essentially gives um, Elon and, and certain employees the option to buy Tesla stock at a current price, at a set strike price in the future. So um, uh -huh. the fact that they're giving that um, that option away, and, and, and there's also other um, items like... Um, there's some historic warrants. It's a very small amount right now, but there were some warrants and um, the convertible debt that that company issued right. a number of years ago. That all, yeah. all of those different um, financial instruments are uh, likely, highly likely, given Tesla stock price right now, sure. uh, to be converted into common shares in at some point in the future. Sure. And so um, this is this is where if, if you're looking at um, non-GAAP earnings per share, for example. Um, so in non-GAAP, GAAP, we essentially added back the stock-based compensation expense, right? So right. all the stuff that you know is non-cash, that is like Elon's stock awards and everything else, we're adding that back. Right. However, if we're going to do it the right way, you know, we should take into account the fact that um, that stock award, that non-cash expense that we're backing out, um, it does have the... The, it's it's highly likely to result in dilution to our current ownership as as um, right. shareholders. So um, so it's something that's not real today, but we should absolutely be aware of as investors. Yeah, well, and, and I just because it, because it might as well be real. It might as well like like unless Tesla stock falls like you know ninety percent or something like that. Sure. Um, that's that's the only situation where you know mo the majority of uh, these you know these warrants and stock-based compensation awards and uh, the CEO plan and um, uh, the, the convertible, and the convertible debt, bonds. Th those are all yeah. so far in the money past their strike prices right. that you might as well I just think of you, you might as well just think that they've already been exercised and just use the fully diluted um, amount. Sure. So when you, when you do that, you're you're more like 1.1 billion shares outstanding. Sure. And so as I'm analyzing the company, that's the number that that I use. I just you know, use the fully diluted amount, and um, I think that's the the right way to, to to look at it. Sure. And so the dilutive convertible debt would be those bonds that um, that almost surely will so you remember in like 2018 ish there was a lot of mm, concern oh, about yeah. about debts coming due that if the if the stock price isn't high enough we want some money oh yeah um, yep. and those i'm gonna say split adjusted those had to be 
fifty bucks a share, probably. Yeah, I, I think I, I read somewhere recently. I don't know if this is current or, or I didn't check the math, but something like those those um, convertible um, uh, bond holders made up something like an, an eight x return, which for debt is like crazy, right? <laughs> like sure, um, but right. but Anything yeah, over, like, yeah. Tesla, Tesla over did that 15% back then. Fifteen percent is pretty good. Well, like fifteen percent um, is junk bond territory, right? Where you're, there's right, like a decent right. chance you're not going to get paid back, right? It's like like fifteen percent is good for an equity return. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's for these right. uh, bondholders to do that was just a, a made, they made a killing on it. But um, you got to think back then when, when Tesla issued these cash flow, it was risky. Was very tight. There was a somewhat real bankruptcy risk. Um, and and sure. they were in a much different spot than they are now. So, um, sure. you know, good for those bondholders sure. to get paid. And, and I think it was a, a good thing for Tesla, too, because they, you know, they saved on some interest expense. So it made their financials look a little bit better. It made their cash flow look a little bit more positive, which was a good well, thing. And but they absolutely needed that cash. They did. Yeah. So so they got yeah. the Tesla got the benefit then and they're paying for it now just with a slight amount of dilution, um, which sure. Yeah, that An amount seems that reasonable. we all agreed to as shareholders. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's one more part to this interview coming, which will be published on the 19th. Links to the first three are below. And uh, the full interview is available now on Patreon, if you just can't wait. A Cybertruck size thank you to all my Patreons who get early access to content like this and others, bonus content, an ad-free experience, and help keep the channel running for as little as a buck a month. I thank you guys for your decision to help out. So what did I miss or misunderstand? Stay tuned, stay juicy, and I can't wait to hear from you clever robots on the smarter side of the balance sheet.